my name is Frank Eckenhofer, and uh, this talk is, I uh, just put the talk together to have an opportunity to share some of my research with you, and also as a sort of an experiment for myself to think through some questions. So it, it'll be helpful to me, and maybe to you too, if, uh, if, as, you, if as you think of things as I'm talking, to, to ask me questions during the talk. I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions, not too many, but enough to connect with what's, what you're thinking about. So my talk is about an experience that occurs in the, in the three traditions I mentioned, Tibetan Buddhism, shamanism, uh, and also Sufism, which has to do with inner guidance, and I'm terming it local and non-local selves, and you'll see why I'm using that Kind of it's, I'm using it in a metaphoric sense, um, but I think it has possible implications for physics too. I'm not a physicist, so I can't work out those implications, but I'd love to be in, in conversation with a physicist to think about what the correspondences might be. For instance, the idea of a non-local self, in some traditions it's called like a, a spiritual twin. You know, there's some kind of attunement between yourself and some higher self, perhaps, and that there's a linkage, there's some kind of a linkage, there's a correspondence, there's an exchange of information from two worlds, two realms. So it's a, that's a kind of an ancient spiritual concept, but I think it has some resonance with some of the ideas that have, are being presented at this conference, too. So what I'm providing is sort of the experiential reports from spiritual practitioners about what is this experience like, and and how does it develop? And I'm also interested at the end maybe to have some questions from, from you about your own experiences in this area. So, um, a little bit about my background. You know, um, I, I did, I was initially involved a lot in meditation research and in meditation, you know, from 19, 91 through 2000, and in 2000 I got very interested in the phenomenology of ayahuasca shamanism and also about doing research in these areas. So I'm a neuroscientist. Um, I use uh, high density EEG to study altered states, but also I'm fascinated by phenomenology. Uh, what is the experience? You know, trying to really look at experience carefully, systematically. So I, I combine qualitative and quantitative research, this talk is not going to be about EEG. But I'm happy to, at the end, answer some questions about EEG if, if someone's interested. Um, the shaman I worked with in, in Peru is right here, this gentleman right here. His name is Guillermo. And um, so later we'll hear some, uh, an Icaro that Guillermo is singing. Um, and my research in India involved the Dalai Lama, and this is wiring up the chanting master at the Dalai Lama's monastery. And then this, at the bottom here, is the research that I've done in Brazil and Peru. Um, so what I'm doing right now is working with some graduate students, doing a series of dissertations, and my also on my research, and it's really on this area of looking at embodied spiritual experiences. And what I mean by embodied experiences, that would mean experiences where people are using their body. They're moving, they're expressing. It's not an experience of someone sitting in a static way. It's embodied, it's dynamic. And um, I wanted to ask you a question as, as you're starting to hear about my interest areas. I'm noticing that I think there's a difference between the phrase inner guidance uh, inner guide or inner guides, and am I right about that? As you think about it in your own experience, if you think about the idea of inner guidance means sort of one thing, but inner guides maybe implies something else. So what is your sense of that distinction for your own experience and what fits with your worldview? Do you have a sense of that? Like what, what, what sits better for you, the idea of inner guidance or inner guides? Yeah. You can use this mic. Uh, 
to me, inner guidance is like um, tapping into this, um, this oneness self. And to me, inner guide seems to be like some, something more localized and n not as complete, but close to me. Yeah. Um, inner guidance, I, you know, might all be an illusion. It might be the same thing, but to me, inner guidance sits better with me. Yeah. Any other thoughts about this about this question? Yeah, to me, inner guidance is much more non-dual. I, I can be in a transitional. I mean, I can be in a state where inner guidance manifests in a non-dualistic way. If I go to inner guide, then I, I move into dualism, and those for me are very discrete experiences. Yeah. I, I think it's important to distinguish um, between uh, guidance that's perhaps directed just for you and your experience and then clarify layers of experience or expansion that then would bring in uh, guidance from others who had a separate manifest experience. So to me, there is this, it's important to show a separation because it shows a progression and an expansion and it enriches the experience because if you are someone who lives in one way and has one experience, I'm from the software industry, I don't work, in, and, and, but I'm also a healing touch practitioner. So I have separate experiences, but then they will come together as I get further out in my own, I think, expansion of consciousness. So you're seeing a relationship between the two that can coexist and be part of a process. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts about this? Yeah, what comes up for me when I'm thinking of inner guidance, because I work with dreams, I'm thinking about processes, like, for instance, access to, to, a, to a dream consciousness in and of itself, and I get guidance from the dream. And, and, but I've, I've heard people will say, well, my inner guides will come inside the dream. So that the guides are more like, you might say, the, uh, um, the entities that comes through the inner guidance process. So I make the distinction maybe in that way. Um, e you know, either way, I, probably for me, I'm, 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 I'm interested in the, in the larger processes and how the inner guides comes. That's not a question I entertain so much. So I'm, that's why I'm, I'm actually okay. interested here. Okay, thank you. So I, I just wanted to have this conversation to acknowledge the fact that people have very many different kinds of ideas about this. And from my experience too, in myself, and also with people I've talked to after going through, say, ayahuasca journeys, that I also get this great range of experiences. It seems like it's very many types of experiences of guidance that I'm thinking not personified, not coming in a, as there's a kind of an inner guide, but then sometimes very much there's inner guides and sometimes there's both interacting. So I just think it's interesting from uh, just a perspective of reports of experiences, it seems to be a great variety of forms, from formless, almost formlessness, to, to taking form. So um, I'm trying to think now a little bit along these same lines about, uh, on the upper left, I'm talking about a local self. So the local self, I'm, I'm just making, I made this word up, I thought, why not? I'll come, it's a conference on non-duality and local and non-local, so now we have a local self. So the local self, our conventional self, or ego self, or ego identity, or finite self. And then, often that's discussed in relationship to our true nature, or primordial self, that is one with ultimate reality. And I want to suggest and, that there's this intermediate possibility too, that these are two poles, perhaps, or two ways of thinking, but I want to suggest too there's something I'm calling a non-local self. The non-local self, again, I'm just creating this definition, uh, experiences in a subtle intermediary realm providing access to many valuable spiritual experiences. So this is something different than ultimate, primordial self, something different than finite self, an intermediary kinds of experiences where there's 
things we learn, encounters we have. Um, and this, this realm and the, the inner guides there have been called by many different things in different traditions. They go, different names are used. And almost all the traditions have some names for, for this domain. But it oft, this domain often isn't talked about. And I'm always curious about that. Because I think, I was thinking, why isn't this domain so much discussed? And I think a lot of times it's actually the advice is to avoid talking about this or, or, being, or being enamored by this or being confused by this. And I think that may be the answer is that it is quite confusing. It, it, although fascinating, uh, very not easy to think about or understand. I think, so, uh, but this is my interest area, so I'm sort of struggling uh, to, to work with this material. So, there's a man whose name is Rawlinson, who in 2000, he's, a, he's one of the cartographers of consciousness, you know, so he's given us this little kind of rational matrix to work with. And on the top, he's saying, certain traditions are hot traditions. And he means by that, that's when you have personified entities that you're working with, that you're encountering. Cool traditions don't like their guidance in personified forms. They prefer, pref, much prefer more diffuse kinds of guidance information. Uh, and on the left side, he says that cer certain traditions are highly structured and other traditions are much more unstructured. And so I actually only just saw this article about a week ago, but I thought I'd drop it into the presentation. <laughs> and this is just a map of all the religions of the world, and there's a whole lot of them. And basically, there's so many ideas about the different topics of different worlds and realms. Um, but almost, almost all the traditions say something about this intermediary realm. It creeps in in some traditions. In non-dual traditions, it creeps in subtly. It doesn't announce itself with a lot of bravado. In other traditions, it's really talked about very explicitly. Well, the blue spots, that's interesting you mentioned. You just keep watching. So the upper left is the uh, where the cosmos is vast and inhabited by innumerable powerful beings. Liberation consists of finding one's way through the labyrinth with the appropriate preparation. This might be the hero's journey. You know, you take a journey, you need a guide, you, you have maps, you, know, you, uh, you have to have preparation. Uh, so there's, this is the framing of, of the story. On the lower left, it's another structured kind of a tradition but liberation is within oneself, but it must be uncovered by disciplined practice. This is Vipassana, according to the author. So upper left, we have more things like Tibetan Buddhism. I think ayahuasca shamanism actually goes in the upper left too. Uh, in the lower left, Vipassana, you know, it's, it's cooler. You know, we're not wanting to engage with entities to t tell us things. However, um, it's quite structured, you know. And then on the upper right, there is divine power, quite other than oneself, which encloses us and is the source of liberation. Again, it's an unstructured approach, maybe, maybe a bhakti approach toward, um, toward experience, religious experience. And then the lower right, one's own nature is liberation. Everything else is illusion. I think that's the main theme for the conference here, for most speakers, is the lower right. One's own nature is liberation. Everything else is illusion, including the intermediary realm that I'm most fascinated by. So this would suggest the instructions in a very brief one word suggestion of what you should do on the path to liberation. Upper left, you jump in. Lower left, you work. In Vedanta, let go. In upper right, submit. So these look like very different instructions, very different 
attitudes. But as I've been thinking about this and noticing my own experience, I don't think they, they're separated like this. For me, they don't seem to be really f separated. And this gets back to your question. I think really we should get rid of those blue lines there that separate them. Okay, no blue lines, no four quadrants. We just have a place we can move around. So if we just move around in that space, sometimes we're hot, sometimes we're cold, sometimes we work, sometimes we let go, sometimes we submit, we jump. I think this is more true for our experience. You know, maybe in certain phases of our life, we have a certain way of being and it works for us at that time. And then we find ourselves at a juncture and we realize now I'm, my practice is different. And I'm also thinking that even in a day, maybe I'm doing these things and cycling through them. So it's not a question of big, long times in my life. But even in a day, sometimes I, I have these different modes of being. So I'm, I want to look at this not so much as different categories, but you know, more like instructions or ways to be with our own nature in the world uh, maybe requires different approaches moment by moment. So uh, this is, when I discovered this book, it was, it's really a fascinating book to me. But nobody else I know has ever read it. And I keep plugging this book, but <laughs> it doesn't really help. But uh, the author is on the right there. Her name is Janet, Janet Gatso. And she's an expert in, in discovering ancient Tibetan texts that are called, um, they're sort of like secret autobiographies. And it's, it's, a, it's a type of text that's written by, in Tibetan Buddhism by very accomplished masters. And the purpose of these texts is to reveal actually the personal experience, not so much the outer story of the religious practice, but the actual personal experience of what it was like to become liberated. And so they're very intimate stories that include a lot of false starts and problems. It's like a, it's, it's, these are like uh, autobiographies of the spiritual path. And if you look at this particular one, one thing that comes out that's really remarkable to me is how much confusion this great teacher had. It was so comforting to me to realize he was so confused, right? <laughs> Even though his students, I think, you know, saw him as so highly realized, his inner process was tormented and he had tremendous doubt. Um, he struggled to understand his own visions. He had visions, but he didn't know. He, he questioned himself, like, are these true visions or am I making this up? He's, he, he had some amazing visions that, that he, it took him 10 years to tell anybody, anybody about the visions he had to, because he wasn't sure that they had any value. He, he couldn't trust himself. So when I read this, I th something in me just relaxed. I thought, oh, this is what the stories I, I need to hear. I need to hear these kind of stories. I don't need to hear stories about someone promoting how easy it is, not easy, but how intact they are. I like the story of how difficult it is and how, because somehow it's, I don't know, it gives me a connection to the process and my own process. Um, so I recommend this book. Um, and she's an amazing author. She's brilliant. She's written other things as well. Um, and, and she's written some chapters and books too. So, and she's, uh, and she's at Harvard. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, why I think the intermediate realm is important and shouldn't be neglected. And I think the reason the intermediate realm is important is it gives people the capacity to express themselves and to feel in an embodied way what their realization is. Like I think Adi Shanti talked about realization here, realization in the heart, realization in the belly. So I think what I'm talking about here is realization in the heart. And it's one thing to do a lot of practices, but what does it feel like? Or how does it, how, how does it become embodied? And I just feel that sometimes words really can't convey 
um, or teach. We, we have to somehow have another vehicle aside from words to be able to take in what we need to embody. And then if we want to express it to others, some way other than words to express. So I just want to play a short... Um, so this is, uh, this is Annie Schilling Droma, Tibetan Buddhist nun. And I just love her. She's singing a, um, I think it's related to Green Tara. I, in my experience, you know, if this intermediate realm is the realm of truth combined with beauty, and, and if we can receive beauty easier than we can receive words, and so it goes right into us. Um, and maybe it takes a while for us to understand what came into us, but for me, it's the reason I'm interested in this realm. Um, and this is a little bit of a big segue here. Um, the reason I, I mean, I had some experiences uh, that feel and tone and kind to, to the beauty of that, of that singing. Um, and when that happened in 2000, I realized I, I have to study this. I just have to, I have to explore this. And I had studied Tibetan Buddhism for 10 years. Um, and I had opened to different experiences, but it wasn't until I um, went to Brazil and experienced ayahuasca, did the, th the, the fullness of it come alive? And so I could actually feel the, the, the strength and power. Um, and since then, it's been 14 years, I've been trying to just study this, try to say, what, how could we, um, it's just an amazing teacher. So I, I think of ayahuasca as like an inner guide. It's, ayahuasca is an inner guide, just as Tibetan Buddhism has inner guides, like blue, uh, green Tara and white Tara. So I look at all, all of these as inner guides, but, but until it activates something in ourselves, I mean, clearly we want an inner guide to become activated in our own being. And that's, that's the, regardless of our perspective, we want to feel a guidance from within. And so that, that process to me seems to be most crucial, you know, the opening to this process of guidance from within and to, to locate that and to al align with that and attune with that. And I think, um, so I've been just trying to collect as much information as I can about that in all the different ways I can personally. And it seems kind of crazy in a way to use brainwave activity, but you know, I have this ability to record brains, brain activity, and so I've, I've used that. 
So the first study I did in Brazil was really with 12 people. And um, they, were, they were drinking ayahuasca, and, and they all had experience before. So they were all like kind of, they were all relaxed about the experience. And, and, and one of the interesting things I discovered, aside from some of the brain activities, was simply that when we have experience in, in, in this realm of, say, waking dream, okay, we're having a waking dream, a lucid, I mean, ayahuasca is much like a waking lucid dream. When we have this waking lucid dream, some of the participants in the study, what they said was, oh, this is just a projection of my mind. You know, my mind is doing this. Those people, that thought, that very thought, that this is a projection of my mind, kept them from having a deeper experience. And these were three young men, and they all passionately wanted to have deep experience. But they had this thought in their mind that they, they couldn't let go of the idea that, that there could be an otherness. Now this is fascinating because the whole non-dual tradition is about perhaps a, you know, a story about the illusory nature of otherness. But for these men, at that moment, when they were having these experiences, these waking lucid experiences, the holding fast to the, to the view that this is just a projection of my mind, stopped the unfolding of that process. Uh, and it was very frustrating to them because they wanted to have a rich and deep experience. And that really stuck with me. That, you know, I'm not saying that, that was the finite mind saying, I don't want to have an experience where I can directly touch something larger than myself or something larger than myself can touch me. Even though part of me wants it really extremely, I'm longing for that, I'm also frightened of that. You know, I don't want to really be touched. When it comes right down to it, I don't want to touch the... And that's what I think this, these, these three men, that's what their experience was. And uh, so I th I, I, it was really a serendipitous finding. I realized there's a fear of religious experience. There's a fear of deep connection, as well as a great longing for it. And that really was startling to me when I, when I realized that. Yes? Yeah. Right. But these were people that came all the way to South America. They spent thousands of dollars. They wanted desperately to have this great life-changing experience and couldn't let go. Couldn't let go and just uh, let the little possibility be there that there should be coming spontaneously knowledge and could come to them. That was, in some sense, too frightening. Yes. And you are aware that that is the actual issue that blocked them because you interviewed others? I'm, no, I'm surmising. I'm speculating. <laughs> I'm, but I, I, what I'm not speculating about was their disappointment. And also, I had like a little microphone taped to their cheek, so I would talk to them every 15 minutes during the session. I'd say, what's going on now? And they would say, I'm having sort of these faint visions I know it's my mind that's creating this. You know, they would tell me what, you know, what their stance was, what their worldview stance was on their experience. So that I know about. Yeah. My experience with the medicine is the context is everything. And so they were like subjects in a laboratory experiment type situation, right? With but they, they had been in other settings too, which were very much in digit. So they, these were experienced people that never had had, yeah, yeah. Well, not for them because because they had been in they had been in you know traditional ceremonies and also and also had problems experiencing. I'm just saying these people had a hard time letting go. These three guys, and they were they were overly rational, young men, very rational young men. 
So again, it is speculation to say that it's fear, but you know. So the, one of the reasons that I really like to work with ayahuasca is because as a researcher, ayahuasca is a great tool because you know, you could wait around forever for someone to have a mystical experience, but with ayahuasca, there's a good chance and a good probability that you're, something will be elicited, right? So from, purely from a research point of view, um, it allows discoveries to be made in normally inaccessible states of consciousness. Uh, and often you can count on experiences that have to do with guidance, you know, as a, you know, of various forms. Yes? Yes. Yes. Someone has to uh, say in his ears uh, all the time uh, all these things that are now happening to you that you're experiencing. Yes, are yes. Only projections of your own mind. Yeah. Um, be aware of this. And yeah. Don't be afraid of them, of all these uh, dark thoughts and, and uh, Yes. Yeah. And Yes, so, yes. So I think it is. I, I you know, I, I think this intermediate realm of it really we all have it at dreaming. We all dream. So we all go to this intermediate realm of, all the time. So we're all dreamers, but we're not lucid dreamers. It's to be awake in dreaming is quite different than just dreaming, especially if it's a very intense lucid dream. So it's startling. Yeah. Daniel. I'm assuming if this was uh, kind of if we were to put a big word on it, like an abortive kind of journey. Yes. You're saying this because you probably have also reports of non abortive Yes, <laughs> yes. And see that oh maybe in others it was not the case. And exactly. No, no. But in, in relationship to what you showed earlier, in relationship to beauty, if there's something that kind of, if it's a projection of the mind, I don't let myself be penetrated by the beauty of what that is. You know? It's almost like, oh, this is me again. You know? Uh, so I wonder if there's something around that prophecy of being able to kind of receive well, well, it projection of your mind to receive it. Well, let's say we're in nature. And we're, we're driving toward the coast, and we turn the, you know, we turn the corner, and there's, there's the ocean. The, the, the ocean is right there, and we get this first glance of the ocean. I mean, we don't turn away from that, right? It, we take it in, you know? And so I think it's more like that. Certain things come, and we just take it in because that's a good question. Why, what are we taking in? And, and why do we, why are we struck by that, that experience? And so the, I mean, it's a question of what is the nature of beauty? You know, what, what is beauty? And, and we feel something when we encounter something vast and beautiful. It, it, it changes us. And I think some people have this experience, you know, which is with the ayahuasca, something is profound that, that comes to them. Um, so I don't have answers. I just noticing things, you know. Um, um, so this is the uh, shaman that I worked with primarily in Peru and who I learned the most about. And he's a Shipibo shaman. And, uh, you know, and in, in Shipibo shamanism, the, the inner guide is the plant teacher, um, the ayahuasca itself. It's considered to be, you know, a guiding, a guiding power, you know, and uh, that's central to their, their cosmology, the Shipibo people. And the also, um, they sing, and they, they, they say, they re the shamans say they receive from, from, um, while, well, after taking ayahuasca, they, they like channel 
uh, uh, healing songs called Ikaros. And I'm going to play just a short passage of an Ikaro uh, from the beginning and you can get a chance to hear what it's like. And this would be an Ikaro, like there's different Ikaros for different parts of an ayahuasca session. And this would be in the very beginning when you just have drunk the ayahuasca and you're sort of needing a little confidence and you're needing a little kind of sweetness to, to make you feel it's going to be okay, <laughs> you know. So they have different uh, healing songs for different moments in the journey. So this would be in the very beginning of the journey where everybody's a little frightened because no matter how many times you've taken ayahuasca, it's very powerful and you never can just take it for granted. And, and so there's, a, there's often a good amount of anxiety right in the beginning for most people. So to me, they sound like lullabies. <laughs> and, they're, and they're soothing and sweet, and you just feel like the perfect mom is there. And, and as you're starting to go through this powerful experience, there's a great sense of, you know, a great mother. Some, you're, you're really being held. And, and so the shamans have developed this amazing these amazing methods to, to shepherd people through you know, this process. And sometimes the, 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 the Icaros are very different where, you know, I think Juan, you know a lot about this too, some of the Icaros that, like when people are getting ready to maybe uh, need, to, need to throw up, you know, what are the Icaros like then? Yeah, I, my first ceremony when we went in 2006 was with Guillermo Arevalo, and he's extraordinary. But the, uh, the Shipibo, I've done quite a few ceremonies with women, the Shipibo women, and they come and they personally sing to you. It's, it's the most exquisite experience of love. They, it's like a lullaby just for you, you know? And energetically, they know where you are, and they guide you, and they hold you. And that, it's, it's an amazing experience. I wanted to comment maybe later about the lucid dreaming. Sure. Oh. Let's talk, let's talk about it later. Yeah. But I'm happy to take yeah. more. So the, the, you know, the, I think there's many kinds of guides and the, I have a favorite guide myself. And my guide is this, this sweet guide, <laughs> okay? Um, the one that I think that with the Tibetan singing that you heard, I, I feel there's a, there's a similarity in, in, I think it's also I, I also feel it in Rumi too. There's a, there's a kind of sweet, delicate, beautiful, kind of exquisite presence that, that goes right into the heart and creates a, a feeling of relaxation and, and opening and, and um, allows you to experience other things. You know, it's sort of like, pre it's preparatory in the sense of letting your heart settle and, and reducing your fear for, for moving forward. And that's the particular guide that I've been most interested in studying because it's the one that I receive the most. And I think it's, um, but there are many. Some of them are, you know, think about Kali. You know, Kali is a guide, right? She's like completely different, right? She's power and enormity and grand, grand so, th so I think each of us has something that we need at different moments. It's not, I think there's, a, this is why I think the, the intermediary realm is complicated. 
There's not just one guide. There's not just one thing going on, you know. There's a lot of different things going on. Our, our, you know, our belly center needs certain things, but our heart center needs different things, right? And our, and our clarity needs. So there's more complexity. There's more stuff. And I think that's why some traditions have, have not wanted to delve into the nature of this, and other traditions have. And uh, I think it's also a matter of your own path and what's good for you. So some people are drawn to um, something that's very direct and clear, and other people like the meandering journey and taking many turns and going through many processes. It's sort of like process or just go there, you know? And I love process, but I've noticed the benefits of just going there too. So even though I start in this process way, I realize sometimes you can just go there. So you don't always have to follow a process. I'd like to make a bigger space for going directly and a process and not have it to be either or, that, that you can have it all. You can have many paths, you can do many things and you don't need to be locked into one particular approach, which is a kind of a heretical idea because that, but that's, I guess, part of my nature. So the inner guide can be experienced in many ways. Uh, internally, you can have an internal experience where there's no personified entity or guide, but there's an energetic field, and you can sort of notice the energetic field in your own body. And, you could, and it also, you feel it can move you. Sometimes people feel that they, like when you're dancing, at some moment something takes over, you know, certain types of dancing, something takes over and you realize you're being moved. You're, you are moving for sure but it feels like there's an energy coming into you that wasn't there before you were dancing and you were being moved. And so there's, it feels like there's a field and you are joining with the field and you are moving with this field and this field has a nature. And, and you, can, you can sense its nature. So I feel that is a guidance, that is a process of guidance too, you know? So it doesn't have to be personified and I think when it's embodied, it's more closer to our conventional self. When I think when it's embodied, because we're moving around in space, and if it's in our body, it's in our body. It's, it's not an vi- experience we had and then we've forgotten it. It's in our body. So the whole idea of embodiment, I think, is, is very valuable because it allows us to bring some of these experiences and understandings and ways of being into, into our world, into our natural world, or into our everyday world. Um, and this is, uh, in terms of Alex Gray, uh, he also is, loves to try to show what is it like when energy is flowing through the body. And I, I think I've, I've met Alex Gray and talked to him and I've asked him about his paintings, and you know he's clearly trying to represent things he's experienced. He's trying to, you know, he's trying to show. And I asked him one time, I said, "You are so amazing. You seem to. Can you just paint exactly what you see?" And he said, "Never. <laughs> I never can paint what I can see. It's always much less than because I, it's impossible to paint what you see or what you feel. There's no way to express. But to me, it's like, wow." Look like he's getting close, you know. But he, it, was, it was good for me to realize that even someone with such dexterity and such skill really does not, is not able to show, really, to express completely. And it gets back to the question of what's the value of showing and expressing completely? Well, let's say you're a spiritual teacher. It would be very good to be able to show and express completely, right? To not have such a limitation about, about your teaching because it it needs to be shown, and not in words, I think. So I've been fascinated by gesture, and these are some examples of gesture. And I think um, part of the embodiment of different experience of guidance have to do with the fact that our body takes on gestures and movements. And, you know, these are 
these are stylized in different traditions, but I think they arise spontaneously in us at certain times. When we have certain experiences, we notice ourselves taking certain gestures. Now these are what I put up here with the, these are the gestures of, you know, the angel, angel Gabriel and the Virgin Mary. These are their gestures. But if you notice, there's a kind of alignment and attunement of the hands. And if you look at the painting, you'll see there's definitely energy you can draw lines between the different hands. It's a kind of a field effect between the two beings. Anyhow, um, that's the end of my formal presentation. Happy to discuss anything with you. Um, any questions? And if you want to get copies of, I've published things on this topic and you know, I can send things to you. That's my email. And also I'm open to anybody that wants to consider being part of a research study or to talk about other things, so, but, uh, I, oh, yes. Yes. But when I first ayahuasca journey, it was an incredible cosmic violence. I mean, it was violence 101. Yes. All the way through from incredible. Yes. And yeah. It, it, do you have a question about, and, like, why is that? And the thing was that they sort of, I was like uh, almost excommunicated from the group. They absolutely. Yeah, I remember talking to you about this before. You know, any group can, like any human gathering, there can be good gatherings and there could be poor gatherings. And I think your experience is an example of people getting together and, and your experience is not handled well. So I don't think that's specific about ayahuasca. I think it's about group dynamics. But clearly what you're mentioning is a lot of times in the beginning of an ayahuasca journey, um, and also for shaman, many shaman talk about the fact in the beginning there's shamanic illness. They, they are dismembered, they, they, they get sick. Shamans are often sick and that's how they become shaman. Um, they go through a crisis and sometimes they feel their bodies are being taken apart. And, and then, then, and it's really a, a, a kind of a mythic theme of death and resurrection. You know, it's a kind of a mythic theme of the dying and the resurrection. And often their bodies are put back together, they have a new body, they know about the putting back together of the body and they become a healer. So this idea of difficulty is part of the story of shamanism. And uh, so anyhow, I think that's, that's something that's pretty classic for, for uh, shamanism and for other traditions too. You know, that there's a dark night of the soul in Christianity. There's a dark time. There's, a, there's, there's barrenness in, in a spiritual journey. Uh, in, in some phases. Yeah. Thank you.